Here's another little chorus, thy word. song says your word is a light to our feet a lamp to our path i pray tonight that that would be the case for us as we uh, delve into scripture look at a familiar topic and taking a fresh look at it that you would mold us around your word god we want to be changed more into the image of jesus christ 
And we also pray for someone here tonight, uh, whether visiting or at church for a long time, that if they do not know Jesus Christ personally as Savior, that is uh, just the biggest decision that we can make here on this side of eternity. I pray that that individual would understand the love of Christ and receive it personally in their lives. God, we ask you to bless this time together. Our study around your word we ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you guys saw Miss Jenny flying in there like a superhero, at least in my book. Yeah, ow, ow. She deserves a raise. Wow, way to go. All right, so we're back to an hour of preaching tonight. No, I'm just teasing, okay? Uh, we're going to look at just two small, itty bitty little verses. You know, um, uh, my mind just kind of works this way. I, I'm looking around across the crowd. Do we have a couple visitors, I believe? And if you are visiting um, first, second time, third time, something like that, and you've not filled out a connection card, there's one in the seats there in front of you. You could drop it by. It's pretty informal tonight. And that way we could just follow up with you and stalk you. No, I'm just teasing. We would not do that. Uh, we uh, just want to be a blessing any way that we can. Um, glad everybody's here tonight. Glad I have my sermon notes. Uh, boy, that just feels really good to have these, all right? The Lost Art of Confession. We're looking at a couple verses together. I want to get right into it and uh, not dilly-dally. Confession is good for the... Ah, good. I thought y'all would know that. Confession is good for the soul. That's where we're going tonight. Proverbs 28, verse 13. Uh, you see it up there. Just follow along. He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoso, what's the, or whoever, what's that next word? Confesses and forsakes, that's another equally important word there, forsakes them will have mercy. Whoever confesses and forsakes his sin, they're going to have mercy. All right, next verse, uh, two verses. This isn't really a expository, more a topical message on this topic, confession in the Bible. So 1 John 1, 9, we get to pick and choose verses here. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I dare say two very common verses that hit on the same theme, and that is confessing. Confessing your sins to God. And another point in our message, we're going to talk a little, hit a little bit about confessing our sins one to another, but primarily confessing our sins to God. I'll start off with a personal illustration. Growing up with three brothers can be a little bit hectic. Three brothers, no sisters, so there were four boys. And guess what? I married my wife. She grew up with three sisters, four girls, no boys. So um, I don't know if I said that correctly, but basically four boys, four girl family, and marriage was very interesting to get used to, okay? Uh, very fun, but three brothers can be pretty yeah, hectic. You guys know what I'm talking about, those of you parents. Uh, the four of us boys would constantly get into trouble. I could tell you about those stories, but you'd be here all night long, and some of them are embarrassing. But I remember one particular instance when we were all playing outside in a field of tall grass. We were a little bit bored of playing catch and building forts, so we thought, let's up the ante and do something exciting. I looked around at all the tall grass and saw all this ammunition for an amazing fire. So you know what I did? Tested out my pyromaniac skills and built me a ridiculous, legit, awesome fire right there in that field next to our house. And some of you guys are like, oh my goodness, okay. So it was awesome and I was real proud of it. And I was like, oh, tossing more grass on there. Yeah, burn, this is exciting and uh, way more better than building forts. And so I ran and got my brothers and I was proud of the fire that I had built. And uh, we almost got there when I watched as that small little fire went, all the way across that field, that small little fire turned into something huge. And all that ammunition was just burnt right on up. And next thing I knew, this huge, colossal, not making it up, fire right next to our house, raging, caught our attention really quick. And we're trying to put it out and I wasn't doing it. And we were trying to not let anybody notice, but the smoke billowed higher and higher. Our neighbors found out what was going on. We live right next to a railroad track. And so uh, the police were called and it was starting to get dangerously close to there, which I guess was some sort of offense. And I thought, oh my goodness, I am in so much trouble. And then I heard my mom's voice, boys. Oh, I knew it. I 
was in bit, and she did talk kind of like that. Uh, my my dad was scary. My mom, scarier. Okay, um, so yeah, and uh, I man, you talk about uh, what's the word mosey? I we defined mosey as we moseyed. At least I did. I moseyed my way on back to the house and tiptoed, uh, and it seemed like forever. Um, and she said, "You who did it? You better fess up." or you're going to be in big trouble. And my thinking was, how much bigger trouble could I possibly be in, okay? And I wasn't in a lot of trouble. I'll let you guys use your healthy imagination to fill in the rest of the blank. But uh, my mom wanted us to do something, and that was fess up who did it. God kind of says something along those lines. He says, listen, Christians, I want you to fess up, except rather than getting ridiculously mad, God says, no, I, this is something I want you to do. I'm inviting you to do it. Um, This is something that I expect out of you. We're looking tonight at biblical confession, the lost art of confession. And I'll explain why I mean lost art. And I believe I'm a little bit old fashioned. Jen says it's the grandpa in me or whatever. I don't know. So I'll identify great. Okay. That's right. So, um, I just feel that we have lost track of what it means to be, um, serious about our Christianity. We've lost track of, uh, the gravity, the things that are at stake in Christianity, including our own personal walk with God, and uh, that we don't treat maybe sin and confessing it as seriously as we should. Not at least as I enjoy reading old time revivals, not the way that those guys learn to confess sin. Man, they got serious. They got um, pretty specific about it. Um, we're talking about confessing our sins tonight. And yeah, I kind of gave you a little bit of heads up this morning uh, to scare those of you off, and it just didn't work, okay? Um, That confessing, that gets kind of personal. I get that, um, but I still encourage you to uh, hold on and say, God, I'm here, and I want to learn from you. Let me start this way before we get into our, our main outline, our main thought pattern here. Let me tell you what biblical confession or the uh, art of confession, if you will, what it is not. Okay, biblical confession is not um, what someone does in a booth talking to another person. That is not biblical confession. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, and that oh, the only one who fits that bill is the man Christ Jesus. That's where we go to. So it's, it's not something along those lines. Biblical confession is not what we do right before we decide to go ahead and do it. Um, that's... Uh, There used to be practice in early church history of indulgences where you'd actually pay money before you'd go out and commit a sin so you could have it somehow forgiven. That's not the biblical confession. A biblical confession is not impressing God with just how sorry we are um, with, uh, so that we can ensure that we're, God would forgive us even more. Okay. There's uh, no way to impress God with just how sorry you are. That's not biblical confession. Um, biblical confession is not even informing God that you've sinned as though he was not aware. So get those misconceptions of confession out of our minds. And let's look at what confession actually is from the Bible. Okay. So if you're taking notes and you know how to spell this word, you're going to be good to go. Sins. What do we confess? Sins, right? All right. So that ought to be pretty easy. I try to keep it easy tonight is sins. And each of these, I guess is it's an acronym. I like to use things like this. Uh, Sin. So this is where we're going tonight. Um, when we're talking about the about confessing the Bible way, we're talking about confessing specifically some ingredients involved in confessing, um, why it's needed, and success. So specific ingredients needed for success, however you want to say it. That's where we're going tonight. So I'll start this way. Number one, specific. So if you're taking notes, write, jot that acronym down, specific. Sin must be confessed specifically. Um, The gentlemen don't have to put the verses back up there, but each of those verses include a couple words that I'd like to point out. It says that um, whoso um, confesses and forsakes his sins, plural. Okay, thank you. Sins, plural. Did you see that? He's not talking about generic willy-nilly, oh, God, forgive me and be on our... No, he's saying sins. He's saying, I'm getting down to business. What's the next verse? Notice what it says there. If we confess our sins, he's 
being very specific. I find being specific typically gets you what you, uh, a little better approach at getting you what you want in your life. I haven't been married super long, comparatively speaking, to some of you folks. Someone just said uh, celebrating 60 years, um, had, had um, parents that were celebrating. That's a long time to be married. Um, but I haven't been married all that long, and there, there's one area in our marriage that my wife and I disagree in, and that is just that I tend to be quite generic. Okay, guys, you can help me out and identify with this. You know, hey, uh, honey, how was your day? Oh, it was good. You know, um, that's not what she wants to hear. She wants to hear all the nitty gritty. She wants to hear everything that's going on, right? And uh, meanwhile, hey, babe, how was your day? Well, this happened and then this happened and then this. And no, I'm just teasing her. Uh, but you get a lot more specific. And I like that because I get a little glimpse of what she has to go through on a daily basis. And that's, that's a good thing, okay, uh, to be specific in marriage. It's also a good thing when we're confessing sins, to be specific about them. Sometimes that's hard thing to do. We don't like to be specific, but that's what God wants us to do. Um, keeping in mind this specific um, sin, I teach the young people all the time, the children, the little guys, sin is anything that you say, think, or do that breaks God's law. So you say, what are we supposed to confess specifically? Well, you're supposed to confess sin. Well, what is sin? Sin is just simply breaking God's law. Sin can happen in things that we say and things that we think, things that we can do. How about say, how's your speech? Think, uh, think, how's your thought life? I shared a challenge not that long ago about your thought life, the war for your mind. You realize God holds us accountable for our thoughts. Don't believe me? Uh, Jesus himself said that it's not just that a man thinks on a woman to lust after her, it's uh, or not that he's committed adultery, but that he in his heart has these thoughts of lusting after her. In other words, it's not just the act, uh, but it's the thinking about it that we are responsible for. Um, of course, things that we do. So these are the things God specifically wants us to mention to him. Think of examples from the Bible. Okay, I'll go through them quickly. Achan, you remember him? Achan was from the Old Testament account of Joshua when they were about ready to conquer the next city of Ai. And they had an amazing defeat against Jericho, a walled city that was deemed impenetrable, absolutely uh, undefeatable, and yet God miraculously conquered the city, the walled city of Jericho, an impressive feat. And so they were riding on those accolades. They went on to Ai. And um, then you remember probably some of the account. If you're not, you can look that up um, in Joshua. But basically that uh, they went on and there was sin in the camp. Achan had stolen a couple things from the treasure that he wasn't supposed to. Not, uh, we would think maybe a big deal. But in God's eyes, that was direct disobedience. God took it seriously. Achan was specific in confessing his sin before God would ever give the victory. Um, David, you remember the situation with him and Bathsheba, was specific in confessing his sin before he experienced joy. Again, Nehemiah was specific in confessing the sins of Israel before God brought revival. Nebuchadnezzar was specific in confessing his sin of pride against God before God restored his sanity. The children of Israel were specific in confessing their sin before God sent judges for deliverance. And the same is true if you desire specific blessings from God, it may be he is desiring specific confessions of sin from you. I don't mean to be rough. And I don't mean to paint God in a horrible, vindictive way, but it would be similar to me encouraging Asher by, uh, with wrong behavior by blessing and giving him things so as to put a stamp of approval on what he is doing. That doesn't make any sense. That's not consistent. Um, and the same thing is true. Is often we forfeit specific blessings from God because maybe we're just not specifically confessing things to God and making those things right. There's a time element to this. Specific sin must be confessed specifically, okay? I think we need to be specific about it. Um, but there's a time element, and that is sin not only must be confessed specifically, but and soon, all right? Specifically and soon. I like F.B. Meyer said, confess 
instantly. The key to successful Christianity, the key to a close walk with God, a consistent close walk with God is confess instantly. You guys realize that confession is something God designed to be um, immediate. It's something that in that moment we realize we oopsed, we get it right. Imagine relationships and marriages if oops and we get it right. Imagine if politics, my word, if we said something cross or did something and we instantly confessed it and got that right. Imagine uh, church, if we realized we did something to offend and we instantly confessed and got it right. I think there'd be a big difference. It's a quick change of heart. What's sad is, again, this is where I feel like we kind of lose grip of the seriousness of this. I know a lot of Christians either that will wait all day and maybe just before the sun goes down, they'll confess sin. But think about what we're doing is we're really going all day uh, with that between wedged between us and God. And that's not a good thing, okay? Um, I know when there's a wedge between Jen and me and I I shouldn't let that go all day long or it's just going to ride like that and we're gonna be walking like this, not together. Same thing is true with God. We ought to be very quick soon to confess. Have you ever waited too long to address a problem? Okay. Um, We got an exhaust problem on our car. If you guys know anybody good with exhaust, I have a feeling we've waited too long. I don't know. That thing's as loud as all get out to me. Uh, But have you ever waited too long to address a problem? Um, I had a buddy who fractured his wrist in 10 different places, his arm and wrist and playing football. And the buffoon waited to get it fixed and looked at and to, as far as I know to this day he's still having problems the doctor said if you would have just came to me right away we could have done something about it um, I've been stranded in a gas station at three in the morning in the backwoods of Kentucky because I waited to fix a problem that I should have fixed way sooner than that on a serious note cancer uh, if left untreated uh, or not treating the right way uh, can be be progressively more dangerous. We know those things to be true. Sin is kind of like a cancer. And the longer we let that ride, the worse that it can get. Uh, The progressively harder it is to handle. The more ramifications that that take place. The, uh, The seeming barrier that exists between us and God, like we're farther and farther estranged from God. I asked my brother often who had gotten into drugs and things and away from God, one bad decision after another. And, um, you know, he often remorses that, oh, I can't be as close to God as you are. And I ask him, well, why not? I mean, literally, God is, isn't he just a prayer away? I, I mean, that's true, right? But when you don't confess soon, next thing you know, boy, it's like this huge distance between us and God. Um, I, I illustrate it this way a lot in marriage, uh, confessing and getting things right with each other right away. You know, babe, that was not I shouldn't have just said that there. Would you uh, forgive me for that? And boom, we're instantly right back on track. What if we did that with God? I think that would be an amazing transformation for some of us. Um, It's estimated that, I I didn't do the research, I don't know how they found this out, that David waited um, over a year to confess what he had done concerning Uriah and Bathsheba, committing adultery, murder to cover it up, lying. Uh, it, it, it said that he went on a year before confessing. That. Could you imagine what that year was like? What his fellowship with God was like? <laughs> Horrible. I'm sure it was just devastation. And I, I, I can't help but say the same thing for our spirituality, our Christianity. We were talking about uh, the lost art of confession and confess specifically that time element. And soon, um, here's the next, the I, and that's ingredients in uh, confessing. And I'll, I'll just say this first one, a good old fashioned word uh, alluding to my opening illustration is just fessing up. You know, that's the word. Uh, first ingredient is just fess up. God isn't looking for us to impress and make an excuse and say, well, God, this happened, this happened, and I'm just oh so sorry. You know what? He, 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 we don't like to hear that as parents. We don't like to hear excuses. A boss doesn't like to hear 10,000 reasons why I was late and then in a little apology caveat at the end. No, we don't like to hear that. God doesn't like to hear. You know what he likes? Just good old-fashioned fessing up to what we did. Just name it. Just say, you know what, God? I did it. Um, but we tend to do the Adam and Eve thing, don't we? 
You guys know what I'm talking about? Uh, Adam and Eve, they uh, sort of ate of that tree that they weren't uh, like supposed to. And what did they do after that? They tried to hide and like uh, God couldn't find them. Um, sort of strange behavior that they did. Adam and Eve, where in the world are you? What are you doing? Um, and then they tried to cover their uh, shamedness up their own way. Boy, don't we do that? Uh, we just go around. I would dare say some Christians live the majority of their Christian life that way, just going around instead of fessing up. The word confess in the Greek, it's homologeo. The first part meaning same. Legeo means I speak. What we're saying is, God, I speak the same thing that you do. God, you tell me this is wrong. I confess I will say the same thing that's wrong. God, this doesn't please you. This isn't what makes me happy. God, I say the same thing. No wonder that um, confession has been linked to starting of revival in past history and cultures when people realize the graveness of their transgressions against God, not to get all serious, but uh, when we match up with what God says, man, it's limitless what can happen, what protrudes from that sort of attitude when we just are willing to fess up. You know what? The opposite of fessing up, it means that we are saying the opposite. If you're trying to live the Christian life and living, saying the opposite, it means you're living a double standard. It means on one side, you want this. On the other side, you're not saying this. Uh, James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. When I think of double-mindedness, Christian life, it kind of reminds me of Lot. Lot was Abraham's. We're using a lot of Old Testament examples. Lot was Abraham, Father Abraham's nephew. They lived in a very prosperous, large city called Ur of the Chaldees. And when uh, shortly after Lot's parents passed away, uh, Abraham almost became a father. Or Abram at that time became a little bit of a father figure to Lot. And the two of them would uh, spend a lot of time together, I imagine. When God's call to Abraham, Abram to come out of Ur of the Chaldees, he did it by faith. And guess who came with him? Lot did. Um, don't you know that Lot wanted to serve God? He left with Abram. You can argue that point with me, and we nothing uh, exactly specifically says it in that text, but Lot wanted to serve God. He's like many of us. Um, he left the comforts of home, which is more than some of us. He knew um, he wanted the blessings of God. After all, he chose the fair land, uh, the prosperous land, and he uh, thought it would be great for his family and his flock, and he even wanted his family to be saved. We have to know those things. The New Testament reaffirms that. Yet Lot had a problem um, that he was living a double life. The only thing he needed to do was really just confess and get those things right. He was living in a wrong city. He allowed that to influence the way that he was living, one bad decision after another. Maybe some here tonight are in a similar situation. Maybe your righteous soul is vexed as Lot was. God calls you to simply confess, fess up, and then forsake it, to get out of there. Um, and that leads me to this next ingredient, forsaking, okay? Forsaking um, means turning a completely around, okay? It's a 180 about turn where you, we're headed this way and we say, you know what, God, I realize that was wrong and I'm going to turn this thing back around. Um, can I say in a very stern uh, but understanding way, confession without forsaking is not biblical confession. Almost expected tomatoes to be hur hurled my way or something like that. Um, confession, this is hard, without forsaking is not biblical confession. What about a, a righteous man falls seven times and gets back up again? I get that. That's so true. But when we are confronted with our sin and we say, you know what, God, I'm going to say the same thing, not forsaking it. It doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean that we won't fall again or go back. Um, that happens because we're human. Even Paul said, the good that I do, uh, that I would do, I don't do, and that which I don't do, I, I wish I did. And, and it is battle back and forth. So it, it, discounting all that, um, that Confession without forsaking is not biblical confession. Uh, confessing involves admitting and forsaking. Even Webster defines confession as an, an acknowledgement of wrong with the 
implication of a change of conviction or a course of conduct. That's Webster's Dictionary that defines that way. So um, 2 Corinthians seven fourteen. if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, God says, I, I can do something about that. So biblical confession is not just first ingredient, yes, is fessing up. Second ingredient, it's not so easy, and that's forsaking. That means making right what had been wrong. That could be some of us in here making right with somebody else. I've heard of of preaching services and revival meetings where the preacher was interrupted because all of a sudden out of the blue, somebody took it literally, they got it from their seat, went across the room to the other side to somebody else that they had offended and got right with that person. I've heard of meetings being interrupted as people would throng the uh, area up here praying or getting down where they're getting things right with God, forsaking, being willing to immediately or as quickly as they can get right with God. That shows a lot of uh, courage, a lot of action. That's what God expects out of biblical confession is um, not only fessing up, but forsaking. And here's this other one, faith. Having faith, uh, that's required. If, If I've said it once, I've said it a million times, stop living the Christian life based on feelings. Okay, I'm, I said that for a reason. When we confess, I know I've done this, we, I've confessed something to God, admit that I was wrong, but I don't feel forgiven. I don't feel like things are right. Um, the sooner we live to li- uh, sooner we learn to live our Christian life less based on feelings and more on faith, the better off we will be. You know what confessing is? It's not a good feeling. It's not that you feel like it. It's not when you get around to it. You know what it is? It's a discipline of your heart that says, God, you said it, you meant it, I'm gonna do it. I believe you said you're gonna forgive me. I'll take you up on that. Wow, God is very, very impressed with that individual that does it, even if they do not feel like it. Psalm 32, five, I acknowledge my sin unto you, mine iniquity I have not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Um, you forgive iniquity, all my sin. We mentioned 1 John 1, 19, if God can... If if we confess our sins to God, he will forgive us. Second Chronicles 7, 14, um, he says that I will forgive, I will heal their land, um, I will uh, hear from heaven. Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his ways, the unrighteous man his thoughts, then God will return unto them. He will have mercy upon them, and to our God he will abundantly pardon. I love that God is emphatic about these things. I will abundantly pardon. That's what I'm looking for. Kind of like the prodigal son. There is God just waiting, saying, please, I just wish that you'd fess up, be willing to get that right, come back to me, and have faith that I love you. I'm going to receive you to myself. The Word of God not only lists certain ingredients involved in biblical confession, but describes our great need for confession, all right? That's our next thought is needed, just how needed confession is. Why is confession so important for you and me? Here's what church father said. The confession of evil works is the first beginning of good works. It's kind of interesting. Um, confessing. Uh, this isn't where I'm going tonight, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that there is a type of confession that's also included in the Bible, um, Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what does the Bible promise there? God says you will be saved. There is a type of confession that says, you know what, God, I realize I'm not as good of a person as I thought. I realize compared to you, I don't match up. I realize if I got what I deserved, I would spend eternity separated from you. I confess. I say that same thing. And God says, I'm so glad that you did. Here's what I want to do for you, what I planned all along. And that is I'm going to reach down and I'm going to save you for all eternity, give you life more abundant. That's what God wants to do. So why is it so needed? Well, confession is needed. It's involved in your salvation. That's huge. Um, There is no other way for us to be saved except through Christ and confessing that. 
Jesus is the only way. We have to call on him. 1 John four fifteen. whoever shall confess Jesus is the son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. Um, plain and simple, he that has the son has life. He that does not have the son does not have life. If you confess Jesus, then God says, I can confess you in that day. I, I will allow you into heaven. So, so uh, it's needed because confession is involved in your salvation. Confession is also involved in our sanctification. That's a long word, sanctification. It means that process whereby we grow in our spirituality, sanctification. Um, It is impossible to grow in your Christian walk without confessing specific sins. Think back to the Old Testament, a lot of Old Testament references tonight. If you go back to the Old Testament, um, what would be required of you every time you transgressed the law, you know what you'd have to do? You'd have to grab an animal, an innocent animal from your flock or purchase one. You would have to march that innocent animal, a sheep or a calf or a goat, to the temple or tabernacle. You would have to be ceremonially clean. You would have to be ushered in. This would take basically all day and a lot of money to do it. Uh, Not that that was the idea, but it was just, it was awfully inconvenient. I'm just going to tell you that. Um, You'd have to march it on up there to the priest, uh, express to God what you did, and then right before your eyes, whoom, there would go the animal at taking its last breath right in front of your eyes. You say, ooh, wow. Animal rights activists today would have a heyday with that. Um, but that's what they did in Old Testament, and it was all a picture of just how serious it is that God takes it when we confess our sins. We don't like to hear that about that. We tiptoe. We don't even like to hear sometimes the word sin. I know I'm not talking to you, sort of preaching to the choir tonight, but boy, this stuff goes over like a lead balloon out there, doesn't it? But this is still needed. We confess. Um, it's part of our sanctification process. Back in the Old Testament, they would do this. Think about the convenience that we have today where we just simply go to God. Jesus rent the veil in the temple, picturing that he did away with the sacrifice. He completed it, and now all we simply do is go to God. Don't let that convenience, uh, convenient Christianity, uh, keep us away from confessing and growing in our sanctification process by doing that. I, I jotted this down. Confession also makes you sensitive. Um, sensitive. Uh, maybe you're con- you're bashful about. Uh, not that we should be this way with God, but I find when I confess to God specific things, it makes me more sensitive about spirituality in my life. Uh, Many blush, someone wrote this, many blush to confess their faults who never blush to commit them. And boy, uh, just something about saying in words, God, I'm so sorry for, oh man, you know what I'm talking about? Like you have to say it, you have to blurt it out there to God. I mean, you don't have to advertise it, but you're still giving it to God. And something about that sort of makes you just sensitive. Ooh, I don't, I don't like that. I, I kind of feel ashamed. I, God, boy, I, I, I don't know. And that's, I think that's normal when we confess uh, why it's so needed is it makes us more sensitive. Uh, we need, need more sensitivity to this area. And I'll, I'll just hasten, we'll get to our last point, and that is this. Um, success. Where do I get this word success? Okay. And the scheme of confessing, well, the, the, our text there says that, uh, but whoso confesses and forsakes that sin, he shall have success. Okay. Um, uh, that he, um, or rather whoso, um, does not confess and forsake, he will not have success. So it's the opposite going on there. Um, But the word of of shall not prosper in our text literally is the meaning. Uh, It means unsuccessful. So if, in other words, by inference, if we want success in our spirituality, we need to learn to confess sin. What do I mean by success? Success in the sense of experiencing forgiveness. Um, Very few other religions around the world experience true forgiveness. I'll share this. Uh, I think we've got time that uh, I remember 
um, taking mission trips. I've been to mission trips, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, New Zealand, Central America, Nicaragua, Honduras, Costa Rica, been to a few mission trips. And all around the world, you see people looking for this, wanting to experience forgiveness. I remember one time, I may have mentioned this illustration already, um, we were in Nicaragua and the in every city centrally located, there is a cathedral. And it's not like a cathedral like you'll see there today. Of course, it's predominantly Catholicism there. And there they will uh, sell candles to these extremely poor people so that they can light these incense below candles of saints in order that they might have forgiveness. I remember one lady, I'm pretty sure I have shared this already, but I remember one elderly lady going up and down the aisle. And it was real dark. It's like kind of scary. uh, uh, um, And I think I misspoke. It wasn't Nicaragua. This was in Costa Rica. Um, there, There was one lady, um, elderly lady going up and down this dark darb, uh, kind of smelly from all the incense, uh, church cathedral. And, um, as she was going up and down this aisle, confessing her sins, we could, I knew a little bit of Spanish to know what she was saying. She was repeating things over and over again, wanting forgiveness, forgiveness, God, please forgive me, please forgive me on her hands and knees. And as I looked behind her, there was actual blood from her knees as she traversed the older lady I thought oh how sad the world is hungering for this forgiveness we have it uh, and we have that promise you say oh I guess I never realized that if we confess our sins we have forgiveness that's I guess that is a big deal yeah it is God says I will have mercy people We'll do all sorts of things, go through all sorts of lengths to get that. Um, Success in the uh, sense of experiencing forgiveness. Um, I'll see if I could say this right. I tried to look up as much details as I could before um, preparing for tonight. Um, uh, You'll find this out that I love military um, and love especially some of the armed special forces. Um, I think I got this right, the details. The Navy SEALs would do this special exercise, underwater exercise, and it basically went something like this. They had limited amount of oxygen to uh, simulate real-life conditions, and underwater with limited amount of oxygen, they had a special device that they had to input the correct code in the correct sequence, or they would fail. Um, what would happen is if they inputted it incorrectly and then corrected themselves and then put the right correct sequence in there, it didn't matter because after the completion of that, for every mistake that they made, there would be more weight put above their heads that they would have to hold up and stay above water. So if they made too many mistakes, even if they corrected it, they would fail. They, they couldn't, it would sink, it was impossible to complete the task, and they would be out. So uh, a lot of pressure was at stake, and I'm so thankful for this. When it comes to God, God is not that way. We make mistakes, and we say, God, I'm confessing, I'm fessing up, I want to get this thing right. God doesn't sit there and hold weights above our head till we fail and we can't go on anymore. That is not forgiveness. God uh, forgives us um, success in the sense of experiencing forgiveness, uh, almost kind of a bit of a liberation. We'll get there in a moment. Um, Success in the sense of enjoying fellowship, enjoying fellowship with God. let me clarify that this verse, what it is not teaching. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't mean that if we don't, we're, we lose our salvation, right? Um, that's not what this verse is getting at. It doesn't mean if we confess enough sins that we merit salvation. That is doctrinally incorrect. That's not what this verse is teaching. However, what this verse is getting at is your fellowship with God is at jeopardy. You are either walking a day with Christ or without Christ. It's plain and simple. Uh, Don't pretend to be walking with God when you're not. Uh, Success in the sense that when we confess, um, success when we confess correctly in the sense of enjoying fellowship. Confession turns your sin from the abyss separating you um, and God to the bridge that connects you with God, someone wrote. Few things accelerate the peace process as much as humbly admitting our own wrongdoing and asking forgiveness. Um, 
just amazing that fellowship. I'll use marriage again. That uh, we we got some premarital counseling in Bible college that I'll never forget. Pastor Frank Camp, uh, if he ever watches this, thank you, Pastor Camp, for saying those things. And he just basically reiterated and drilled in me, Brett. If you if you offend your wife, if you say something cross, you need to get that right, or the kissing ain't gonna be good that night. He was a Southern boy. Uh, Brother James would appreciate that. Uh, and I, I can't quite get that said, but man, he he could he really thundered that in my head as just making sure I stay right with, with that girl over there. And same thing is true with, with God as that right fellowship, uh, that fellowship is at stake. Success in the sense of experiencing forgiveness, enjoying fellowship, and also enjoying freedom. Um, I feel like this is another aspect that could be included. It's similar to the others, uh, but slightly different. Um, I, I, I wrote this down, just a quick little story by way of illustration of uh, freedom that we experience. A Prussian king uh, named Frederick the Great was once touring a Berlin prison. The prisoners um, fell on their knees promptly before him to proclaim their uh, innocence, except for one man who remained silent. Frederick called to him. Why are you here? Armed robbery, your majesty, was the reply. Well, and are you guilty? Yes, indeed, your majesty. And I deserve my punishment, the man exclaimed. Frederick then summoned the jailer and ordered him, release this guilty wretch at once. I will not have him kept in this prison where he will corrupt all the fine, innocent people who occupy it. Interesting turn of events that they didn't expect, uh, but it sort of illustrates something that there is a sense of freeing uh, and there's success in that. Uh, it's very hard to be successful and bound by uh, a sense of guilt, um, but there is freedom in, uh, in just confessing our sins one to another. I'll conclude with this, and y'all have been doing great uh, listening. One of my favorite topics, I mentioned this near the beginning, is to read about old-fashioned revivals. One book I'm reading now is called, uh, not right now, but I had read a little while back ago, it's called By My Spirit by Jonathan Goforth. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, a uh, popular missionary. Um, Mr. Goforth recounts a story about a spiritually dead congregation of believers at Nushuang in Manchuria, I think is how you say it. Even as a missionary who worked there commented, the church there is so dead it ought to be buried out of sight. The consensus of the majority of safe people in Nushuang was that the church was too dead for anything to happen and past hope. After much prayer over the church, Jonathan Goforth began meetings there. He writes, on entering the pulpit, I bowed as I uh, usually do for a few moments in prayer. When I looked up, it seemed to me as if every last man, woman, and child in that church was in the throes of judgment. Tears were flowing freely and all manner of sin was being confessed. Before he even had a chance to speak a word, sing a song, offer a prayer, revival seemed to break out across the congregation. What was the solution? God's people confessing their sin. What may be hindering us here tonight is that God is looking for us to confess and forsake just as he commands I'll ask this question as we conclude tonight uh, and just give us a free mo uh, few moments tonight just to do business with God. Is confession a lost art in your life? Is confession a lost art in your life? Maybe you're at that point tonight where you've never confessed Jesus Christ as Savior. As I mentioned this morning, that is the best confession that we can have, that, that it makes eternity's difference. And uh, we, I'd be glad to show you uh, from the Bible how you could do that, and I'm sure anybody here would. Uh, but for you as saints of God, is confession a lost art in your life? Here's what I want to do tonight. Um, again, a little bit different even than this morning, is I want to conclude in prayer. And as I do so, just give you a few moments, no need for piano or anything like that, nothing flashy. Uh, again, just a little bit different, and just encourage you to say, you know what, God, um, maybe it's specific things. Um, you don't have to come up here, uh, but just right there where you're at, 
I'll conclude in prayer, and I encourage you to do business there with God. God, as we conclude tonight, this is a little bit uh, serious, a little bit sobering of a challenge, um, I confess, and um, God, that we just, but I, I feel that we need this. Um, Lord, I'm not pointing at anybody specifically except for myself. God, I know that I need this. Thank you for revealing yourself and revealing your purpose here uh, as it relates to this particular area of confessing sins. I pray that folks tonight wouldn't just hear, but would heed your word. Maybe some folks are doing their own thing between you uh, and themselves tonight. Maybe some are confessing specific things. Maybe some are just taking a little bit of evaluation of this aspect of their Christianity. Whatever the case may be, I, I pray that you bless this time, God. The, all, all the Bible study, it, it's neat to peer into your word, but I, I just feel this is where the rubber meets the road, where folks uh, respond to your word after hearing. So I pray that we would do that, that we would do business with you tonight. Um, and I just pray that you would work in these next few moments of silence as, again, folks just uh, deal with uh, things that you've spoken to their heart. We pray these things in Christ's name. No one looking around, just between you and God. I'll be quiet and give you a chance, an opportunity just to respond. Again, nothing flashy, showy, and a little bit different tonight. Once again, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the sincerity of believers here tonight. Um, we thank you for the challenge from your word. Sometimes your word is used to encourage, heal, lift up, uh, replenish. Sometimes it's used to convict us. And tonight I, I feel convicted. And um, Lord, I, I just pray that some lasting decisions, maybe some specific confession was was made tonight and uh, just your people plain and simple good old-fashioned getting right with you and as you point things out in their life thank you so much for them god and i pray as we go about our rest of our week and um busyness of life that we wouldn't forget you and forget this matter here of getting specific with uh confessing uh specific things to you god thank you so much we love you in christ's name we pray amen all right. Well, that's about all that I have for you tonight. Uh, trying to think of any last minute reminders before um, we dismiss you. Does Pastor Chad normally do uh, collect offering in the evening? Uh, okay. If he normally does, maybe we'll have a couple gentlemen go. If not, we uh, don't need that. If you, either way, if you um, ha have something that you would like to give, that arrangements could be made. We don't need anything formal to do that. Um, but um, gentlemen are getting prepared uh, either way. So that could just be on your way out. Um, we have nursery help that we still need. Um, so uh, I'll say this, that you may not realize, I know uh, often we look to the ladies, but also married couples can, if they're working together, um, that would be suitable for nursery ministry as well. So that's a little bit, uh, some just may not be aware of that. Maybe that'll fit the bill of what uh, God's put on your heart, some nursery work. And then we've got grounds ministry um, as well. Uh, just signing up back there for that. Am I leaving out anything? Father's Day service next week. Stay tuned for some details, what we're going to do that. Pastor Chad is out for the week. Um, you guys ever heard the saying, when the cat's away, the mice will fly? We should do something, something just real. No, I'm only teasing. Uh, besides, he's, he's listening to everything we say right now. Um, so, um, oh well. Uh, no, I'm only teasing, but I hope he's having a great time away. 
Uh, that, that is all that I have, folks. Feel free to stick around to fellowship. Be conscientious. We are still trying to be um, uh, just conscientious of those that with the coronavirus and things like that spreading around. Pray for the fifes. They are still awaiting a uh, test result. So uh, Ryan and Amanda and their family, and I just heard that Mariah is um, also sick. So, um, you know, we're uh, on, I don't know the latest and greatest on that, but uh, let's lift them up. So um, that is about all that I have. So on that note, God bless you guys. Have an awesome week. Thanks for coming tonight.